Great, thank you. And we'll have uh, Joseph introduce himself towards the end when he um, is here. I'm not sure if he's here, but he'll introduce himself at that point. Magda Yamamoto is another of our advisors for international area studies. She's not here with us uh, right now, but um, she will also be available for advising if you're interested in doing honors. Okay, so we'll start with the benefits of uh, doing independent research. So this workshop will go over how to um, narrow down your topic, your research um, uh, question. When you do that, you're going to start doing uh, working with faculty members. You're going to go into the library. Some of you might be doing even interview, interviewing, interviewing people for your research. So throughout these either two quarters or the entire year, you'll be gaining valuable research skills. Um, you will be engaging with faculty members, which is very, very important. Um, not a lot of students get to do that when you have really large classes. And also you'll be expanding your interests, which many of you are in a topic of your choosing. Um, and this is very, very important. And probably uh, Jessica, for example, she's doing her, uh, will be working on her PhD soon. And she uh, will be able to advise you on how important it is to, especially if you wanna go to grad school, to get these skills as an undergrad, um, knowing first of all, if you like doing research and is that something that you wanna do in the future. So hopefully throughout this journey, you'll be able to learn a lot of different uh, new skills that um, you haven't yet in class. Um, these are the requirements, yes, go ahead. Yeah. So now just a brief overview um, of the requirements for international and development studies, international area studies and global studies. So for IDS and international and area studies, it's for majors and seniors only. And for global studies, it's majors only, but you can do your thesis um, junior year or senior year. Um, for both IDS and international area studies, this is an optional. Um, and for global studies, it is required. It is part of the major. Um, for IDS, you need to have at least two IDS core courses completed before applying to departmental honors. And for international and area studies, you need to have all prep courses completed. For global studies, um, you need to have all core courses completed as well. Um, for IDS, the upper division GPA requirement is a 3.5 for your major and a 3.0 overall. For international and area studies, you need a prep and upper division major uh, GPA of 3.5 and a 3.0 overall. And there is no GPA requirement for global studies because it is part of the major. So it is a requirement that you need to fulfill. Um, the honors application is two weeks, is due two weeks prior to the senior of your fall, or sorry, the year of um, fall quarter. And you have to secure a faculty advisor um, by then. And for global studies, we ask that you secure an advisor by week two of fall. So now I think we have another poll. So this one is going to be about your concern. Um, and what is your biggest concern, um, whether that's finding a faculty member, choosing a topic, um, or time management? So just a few more seconds to make sure everyone's participated. So, so far, it seems to be that it's finding a faculty member. Waiting on a few more people. Okay. So the biggest concern seems to be uh, finding a faculty member, and that's completely understandable. Um, so Olivia is going to talk a little bit more about finding a faculty advisor. Yes, so as you can see, you're not alone in that <clears throat> one of your concerns, uh, common shared concerns is finding a faculty member. And we've seen students kind of solidify this early and in advance. And then we've seen some students that have, you know, last minute things have changed and they're scrambling. So um, 
we'll get into some tips for finding, but just to make sure you are aware of the eligibility requirements. So for global studies, the faculty member has to be in residence for at least winter and spring. For international development studies and international area studies, the faculty member has to be in residence fall, winter, and spring. Um, so I know it says up here winter, spring, but please hear, hear this. Uh, and it, it is on the application and handbook, I believe, for both IDS and international area studies. So fall, winter, and spring residents. The faculty member can be technically from any department. So it doesn't have to be global studies. It doesn't have to be international development studies or your major department. And um, the faculty member should be a permanent faculty member. So sometimes we get students asking about lecturers and you can, uh, I believe, go through like a petition process through our departments um, to see if the lecture would be approved. So you don't wanna just assume that like you find a lecture and we're gonna approve it. You would want to work with your uh, major department advisor and, and um, basically go through a petition process for that. Is there anything, ladies, that they should know about that in terms of petitioning for lecture? Because uh, sometimes some students won't know who's a lecturer, right? Because these this professors are teaching classes, you don't know the difference. The way you will know is if you go to the UCLA directory and you just type in their name, it will show up if they're a professor, assistant professor, associate professor, or it will say lecturer. If it says lecturer, that is when you have to verify they will be in residence a lot of lecturers are visitors so they will only be here in winter or just in spring so you have to verify that they're here during the time you're writing the thesis once you verify that that's when you email our office with their name and um and tell us why you're interested in this particular lecture to advise you and then we'll go from there um there's not a specific petition but we, we that's how you start the process the petition perfect thank you for clarifying sandy Okay, so let's take a look at, um, I believe, the next slide, finding faculty. So this is, again, basically um, a step that you want to think about in terms of maybe if there's a professor that you've really connected with in the past, particularly one that you've already taken a class with, um, that could be a starting point for you because they can at least kind of speak to your abilities and they kind of know you already, you may already have that existing relationship. Um, you can also look up through each of the departments and through the different research centers websites, and you can kind of take a look at faculty that way. You can also look up like different faculty members um, areas of research, and I think that um, can also be found through the department websites. They usually have like bios on their faculty, and that can be really helpful because you want to find someone who is going to not only help you through the writing process, but more so the area that you're interested in researching, and you want to make sure that the um, faculty members research is kind of consistent or along the lines of what it is that you're interested in researching so they can give you appropriate guidance. So those are a few tips there. Um, in terms of making contact, I think the, the biggest thing is, you know, we, starting early and um, visiting either their office hours or following up with them via email um, to see kind of when they might be available to chat about this particular request um, that you're making. So definitely like there's virtual office hours or in-person office hours attending those. Um, and then when you do have a faculty member established, you know, once you begin the process, like we do recommend that you check in with them regularly, but um, definitely we encourage students to, you know, come prepared with your questions, uh, be open to whatever their suggestions are. If they're not able to assist you, because you you may and most likely will get some no's potentially, so be prepared for that. And don't take it personally, just know that the faculty have a lot on their plates, right? So it's just having um, multiple options um, and kind of going, going through and seeing if there's other people that you have that you can reach out to or seeing if they would have any suggestions if they're not available. Um, if they have suggestions for another faculty advisor. Um, 
and just, you know, understanding like it's, it's a process and some of them can commit now and that may change in a few weeks and then they may not be able to. So you, you wanna stay flexible and be respectful and as courteous as possible because this is extra for them too. So um, keep that in mind. Like um, it's not their requirement, but they're they're kind of helping you out. And most of them are, I'm sure, very happy to help. Uh, I don't wanna make it seem like they're not, they're not willing to help, but just, just being flexible. And sometimes they're unresponsive advisor, uh, unresponsive faculty or faculty advisors. So what's reasonable, I would say five to seven business days is probably appropriate. And then you could follow up with a polite email. If you still don't have a response, um, then you can see if they have office hours. And at the end of the day, if it's not working out, they're not communicating with you, that, that to me, that's a, that's a signal. Keep that in mind. Take that as something that if you are working with that faculty member later on during your project, that could be problematic if you have an unresponsive person. So that may be a, a sign for you to move on to the next person. And now we're going to go ahead and go into some resources that are available to our students. So to look at the curriculum and the requirements for courses, requirements, quarterly deliverables, uh, we really encourage you to check the website and we've actually created a handbook for departmental honors as well as for the global studies thesis with all the timeline, you know, what you need to put in your course contracts when they should be turned into our department for review. So we really encourage you to look at our websites and look at these resources. At the end of today, um, we will also be sending out an email to you with um, the research workshop packet and the recording so that you can view that as well. And so also a great um, resource is the UCLA Library and the research workshops and WIRE. There are workshops that are available to you that give you a great solid foundation in academic research and writing, especially if you're just starting off and don't really know how to begin. Um, a lot of the workshops are online and they're either live or if you can't attend them, then you can watch a recording. There's also quick tutorials that you can watch in case you forget something or you just need a quick refresher um, and you can also use them to practice. Um, handouts are also a great way to kind of, you know, have something readily available to you in case you forget um, or if you just prefer to work on paper. So those are really great to visit. Um, and then we also have a couple of events coming up. So we have the Going Global Conference, which is Thursday, May 26th. And a lot of the students already submitted the abstracts for that. Uh, we really encourage you to attend. That way you can kind of see how other students present their research and you can gain some insight on that. It's also a really great way to connect and see if there's other students who were conducting research on something, a topic that you may have been interested in. It gives you a way to reach out to them and you know, kind of see what they did or who they spoke to. Um, and we also have UCLA Undergraduate Research Week, which is available to all UCLA students, and it's May 23rd to the 27th. Again, it's a really great way to kind of see how students present their research, see if there's, you know, maybe a topic that you were thinking about but weren't sure, um, and just kind of getting ideas and being able to network with other students and other faculty that might attend. All right, so we actually have a student panel and we've designated about uh, 12 to 15 minutes or so uh, to go over a few questions. We'll have them answer, um, but first let's, um, well, yeah, let's have them turn on their videos if they're not already on. But we have three current um, departmental honor students. So we have Mary, Maria, and Amanda. And I just wanna jump in with our first question for these three wonderful ladies. And for our uh, student panel, our, our three guests, if before you answer the question, if you could also just kind of reintroduce yourself, but also state your thesis question, um, that would be awesome. But basically we wanted to start off by you sharing um, how many topics 
did you first have in mind? And then what was a strategy that you used to narrow down the thesis topic? So again, how many topics did you have in mind and how did you narrow it down? And then don't forget to just say your name and your thesis question. So we have Mary, Amanda, and Maria in any order, you guys can just jump in. Okay, so hello everyone, I'll start us off. So I'm currently at UCLA, so I'm sorry about all the background noise. Uh, my name is Mary and I'm majoring in International Development Studies. I'm also minoring in Russian. And my thesis question is the following. Under what conditions has Ghana's political regime type impacted its economic performance throughout its post-independence history? Also in particular, I uh, wanna know how the switch from autocracy uh, impacted Ghana's uh, economy. So since 1992, I'm also interested in examining the role of the Bretton Woods uh, institutions, which would be the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, on the production of economic reforms. And I want to study the relationship between the economic reforms and the political reforms. Uh, and now going back to the question. So since the beginning, I had one, this specific topic. And after my African politics class, I was very curious to learn more about the relationship between Ghana's economy and politics. And um, Having this opportunity basically gave me the uh, possibility to do the research and learn, learn more about it. So it has been this one topic and there was no other strategy I used to narrow down. Thank you, Mary. Amanda or Maria? Yeah, I can go next. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm a global studies major and I'm minoring in Korean. And my thesis is on the South Korean boy band BTS and their fans army and how they use their transnational fan networks to engage in social activism. So some of the questions I'm exploring are what are influencing BTS's fans to engage in social activism? Um, how does the spread of the online fan culture from various countries around the world. And also how do global fan movements impact real world events such as Black Lives Matter? And um, for me, my topic originally, like when I decided to do the global studies major, I knew that I wanted to do it on BTS. I just wasn't sure what specific topic. So when it came to fall quarter and we had to decide and narrow it down, um, I was just thinking of certain things in the fandom that I was really curious about. And there was a lot of um, specific case studies with social activism that had been in the back of my mind. So that's what made me want to go down that route of social activism. Nice, thank you, Amanda and Maria. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Maria. My major is European studies. Um, so my thesis questions right now are, they kind of focus around like artificial intelligence and machine learning and how that can be applied to research in the humanities, the social sciences, but deep, more deep into my research, my question is, um, how, do you, how does artificial intelligence and machine learning, like how does it prevent or promote like violence? Because my main thesis question, my main thesis focuses on like the Armenian, Assyrian and Greek genocides of 1915. Um, and circling back to the question, uh, the way that I narrowed down this topic is really from my own personal experience. And um, so it came from like a very like intimate point within myself because my family was affected by the Armenian genocide and all of those historical occurrences of 1915. But approaching this paper, my, uh, my topics were very scattered. I didn't know where to start. Um, some of the beginning, like the seedlings for my questions, I was thinking about focusing on like different, um, focusing on like the Armenian, Assyrian and Greek communities, like globally today, like where those communities find themselves, like either religiously, ethnically, um, depending on like where they are, or, like where they live. Um, so yeah, I, uh, in the beginning, I was focused more on the humanities aspect and like the personal aspect of it, but really filtering it through an academic lens, I think, helped me to kind of narrow down my focus and round it out between like the humanities and having a bit more of a technical side with it. So that's why I decided to add it in 
add in the artificial intelligence components. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. And as you can hear based off of these ladies and their topics and what they've shared, like some of the research topics are from a very personal spot, right? They come from a very personal place. And then some it's based off of just general interest. So definitely some things to think about as you consider your thesis topic. And we we do have like a fall meeting where we, we host a workshop and we have a guest speaker come and she talks about how to help narrow down your topic. So don't feel like you're just like thrown out into the wolves and there's nothing out there to support you. But yeah, we, we try to connect students to the resources and certain presenters um, on campus that will kind of give you some extra tips. So one of the big uh, topics that students said they were a little concerned about or um, just nervous about was finding a faculty advisor. So for, for the three of you ladies, um, in summary, how was the process for finding your faculty advisor and what tips or advice would you share? Um, okay, so for me, uh, first I took two classes with Professor Posner. Some of you uh, may have taken a class with him before. So I went to his office hours and shared with him my research topic. And then he advised me to reach out to Professor Lapshi, uh, who has been to Ghana many times and he even published two books about Ghana. So he was very knowledgeable about um, Ghana in specific. And then even though I never had a class with Professor Lokshe and I didn't know who he was, um, I was still um, bold enough to email him and then let him know what my research was about. And then we set up a Zoom meeting. So that was an opportunity for me to speak more in detail what my research was about and how I was going to address some of the important questions. Um, after that, we submitted the necessary documents to the ideas department, and then we started working on the research project together. Wonderful, Mary. So actually the person that you originally reached out to ended up referring you to someone else. Yes, so that's that one example. Correct. Yeah, yeah, so that happens. Um, Amanda, Amanda, I think you were gonna speak next. Oh yeah, for me finding my advisor, um, I first looked around for someone related to K-pop since my topic was just so specific and kind of niche. And there's only one professor at UCLA who does that. And unfortunately she did not have time to work with me. Um, so she did recommend someone who I reached out to who also was busy. So I had reached out to a TA that I had who has similar research interests as me, and he had recommended some of his advisors, and unfortunately they were busy too. So I ended up reaching out to a Korean history professor that I had taken a class with. Um, I had taken that class online, so I hadn't really in, like interacted with that professor, but thankfully she had remembered my work and we set up a Zoom meeting and discussed my topic. And she doesn't really know much about BTS and like K-pop and the fandom, but it's actually worked really well because I'm, I feel like I'm a little too close to that topic. So it helps to have someone with like that outside perspective to help me understand like what isn't known, what's not like common knowledge to people and like how I need to explain that. Thank you for sharing. So you hit a lot of roadblocks there, which is an, yeah. another um, reason why you don't want to wait to the last minute to find a faculty advisor. The ladies are shaking their heads. Yes, yes. Okay, Maria. Okay, yeah, so um, approaching my faculty advisor, I had I had quite the opposite situation from Amanda. I, I was lucky. I um, the first faculty advisor that popped into my head was the, actually the first professor that I ever had here at UCLA before COVID. Um, so I just remembered back to her. I remembered her research interests aligned very nicely with mine because her research focuses on like um, Sephardic, Jew, uh, Sephardic Jews in like the Mediterranean region in Spain, Southern Europe, the Ottoman Empire. So um, I made sure to focus on a professor that shared like similar topics with me. So, um, so the, la the next time that I connected with her was actually via email after COVID had happened almost a year and a half later, I reconnected with her and thankfully she was able to 
agreed to advise my project. Um, so, but yeah, I just want to reiterate that you want to have at least one to two, possibly three backup professors if your first choice doesn't work out, because I was very lucky my first choice worked out. Um, and also just making sure you have something in common with them, like making sure the, uh, to like ensure like good chemistry works. So um, that's one of my uh, personal takeaways, so. I love that. Thank you, Maria. And thank you for, for emphasizing the, <laughs> have, have those backup options just in case you never know. And then what we're going to do for our, I think final question, just because I'm going to be sensitive to time is we're going to kind of combine this last question for, for the three ladies. So what has been the most challenging part of the process for you? How did you tackle it? And then what is it? like either something that's been so rewarding or what is the biggest skill that you've gained? Um, so, oh, Maria, did you wanna go? No, you can go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so the most challenging part for me was just finding the re reliable, credible and useful sources for my research. Uh, because unfortunately, along the way, you'll read some sources that are very yes useful and add a lot to your research. However, some of the articles won't be that helpful. And at the time, you might think it was just waste of time. But unfortunately, that happens. And when we first start to read an article, even a book, we have no way to determine whether it's going to help us or not. But I would definitely say to not give up because that is just a natural process. You have to read through all the data and then filter through to understand what's going to help you and what won't. Um, that's why just that was the most challenging part, just trying to find the articles or like resources, the books that would tackle my research question and add some valuable information to it. Um, and then the skills, I think for me, it would be uh, the top one would be uh, the critical thinking because the project has improved my analytical skills a lot. Um, I became a lot better about uh, evaluating the sources and then utilizing them to promote a maximized efficiency. Uh, and the articles that I read, uh, they definitely helped because I still needed to identify and fill some gaps that were missing from those articles. So that helped to uh, use some of my creativity and whatever I read, just connect those two together and fill in the gaps that were missing. So. The research project also allowed to be uh, creative and uh, give my unique approach. My advisor says that a lot to me. He says, this is your opportunity to present to us how you think about the project. And it might change in a year, but uh, just use whatever evidence you have right now to give us your understanding and approach about the issue. So it's good to know that even by being an undergraduate student, you have the chance to explore uh, more research and then give them, uh, give the readers your understanding of the topic. I think that's very rewarding. And then of course, it's gonna stay with you for the rest of your life. So definitely recommend it. Thank you, Mary. Amanda, do you wanna go next? Yeah, so for me, I think the most challenging part was I felt like I was too close to the topic material because I've been a big fan of BTS for over four years and I've been like analyzing the fandom and how it works online. And a lot of like my social circle is into that stuff. So I was having trouble understanding like what exactly I needed to explain and what I needed to prove because a lot of this stuff I felt like was common knowledge. Uh, so just talking with people, literally anyone and everyone, like I always tell people when I'm in global studies, like, oh yeah, I'm working on my thesis and they'll ask, oh, what are you writing about? And just having to talk to people about it, they ask questions like, well, what do you mean social activism? And like, well, how does the fandom work? So I think that's kind of how I overcame it, just talking to a lot of people. And in terms of skills, uh, I think my communication skills have improved a lot. I've had to write a lot of emails, attend a lot of Zoom meetings and reach out to a bunch of people, which I was a bit uncomfortable doing at first because I felt like I was asking for a lot, especially from like my advisor. Um, but it's taught me a lot with communication and also just being able to analyze text. There's You have to do a lot of research and a lot of reading and be able to do it quickly and you know summarize it very concisely and get the key points. So having to repeatedly do that, I feel like my skills have improved a lot. Wonderful, thank you, Amanda. And finally, Maria. 
Yeah, so similar to Amanda, just like sifting through the massive amounts of data, text, like images that you're just uh, confronted with at the beginning. Um, I would say that's definitely one skill that I've developed throughout this whole process is just being able to pick out which one is going to be the most relevant for my paper. But um, in terms of the most challenging part of this research it has been just either starting it or writing it or overcoming any type of writer's block. So with that, I've learned to just, when, when I need to take a step back, like I can come back to it. And another part of that is being able to work like out of sequence on your paper. If you get what, if you get stuck on one part, then you can, again, take a step back and either go back to the same part or just work on a completely different part of the paper so that you can come back to the initial part that you were stuck on with like a fresh mindset. Um, another skill that I've definitely obtained throughout this whole process is just building a relationship with a professor that um, goes beyond just, you know, the formal like, oh, hi, like I have a question and then you leave. Like, no, you have to have like, you have to build a rapport with the professors. And for myself, that was never a thing that came naturally to me, but this, definitely was like a really good way to ease myself into that. Um, and also, again, another skill is just being open to feedback, being able to adapt to it and just being flexible throughout the entire process. I would say that is one of my paramount takeaways. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for sharing. Thank you so much. As you guys can all see, like, you have different journeys, but you're all kind of going through the same thing. So as you all enter this process, whether it's required of you or it's by choice, just know that you're not alone. I mean, you have your faculty advisors, you're building that rapport, as Maria mentioned, but um, you also have each other when you're going through the process. And we can't stress that enough because um, some of you may be thinking like, oh, I feel alone. Like this is, this is, I'm the one going through writer's block and everyone else seems to be figuring it all out. And then you realize that when you're talking to your other classmates and stuff, like you're not, you're not alone. So there's a lot of different skills that you can gain from this experience, um, which the ladies have emphasized. Um, and we always kind of reiterate throughout the process, right? Don't forget, these are very transferable skills, not just for potentially graduate school, uh, your coursework, but also for jobs and, and what employers are looking for. So keep that in mind. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to Sandy, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Yes, well, thank you so much for sharing, uh, ladies, and for being here and volunteering to give your wonderful insight. Let me introduce Joseph Yu to all of you. He is our Global Studies Librarian. Um, Joseph, would you like to say a little bit about what you do and how you can help our students? Sure. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I've been working with the Google Studies program for more than 10 years and working with students, and that's one of the joyful part of my job. Um, I am available to help students brainstorm their topics, you narrow down their topics, find sources, uh, troubleshoot, finding data, evidence, that kind of things. Uh, I'm available from now on to you file your thesis. So uh, I'm another resource available to you. Great, thank you, Joseph. If you are not Global Studies, we also have a librarian for International Development Studies and for our area studies so that you can find them on our website under the honor section. Uh, but Joseph is great at helping students uh, narrowing down their question, the research question, which seems to be, uh, it is a very challenging process. So I will share, I will begin by sh continuing sharing our PowerPoint where uh, Joseph will present on Narrowing down your topic. So we ask you today to come uh, prepared with a topic and maybe a couple of questions. So hopefully you had some time to think about it. Um, but I'm gonna pass it on to Joseph. Great. Um, I know that some of you have concerns about how long the thesis paper is. Um, in fact, it is actually not that, um, the challenging part is not that it's long, it's actually, it's very short. Um, that means that you have to get to the point pretty quickly. And, but the most challenging part from in the past decade, um, students find is finding a topic because it takes a lot of thinking. Uh, it's a very iterative process. You do some ideas, you do some research, 
you read about other sources, you get feedback, and then you revise your topics again and uh, keep refining it, refining it until you get to a point of a really good research questions. Uh, it comes with a lot of experimentations, trial and error. Uh, and I think the key important things is getting feedback along the way uh, from fellow students, from uh, faculty members, from your advisors, from librarians, from anybody uh, who might be able to listen and give you some ideas, feedback. As one of the students mentioned that uh, it also gives you a good sounding board in terms of knowing whether you're too close to the topic or not. So how do you find the topics? Uh, what are some issues that grab your attention? What inspires you? What provoke you? Uh, think about the classes you have taken, uh, recent events, uh, your own heritage or your own experiences, what are your hobbies and interests? Find, the most important thing is to find something you're passionate about. Um, it is to the point, I would suggest that when you decide to go out, um, you want to kind of have something that is have to wait to say, okay, I may want to do some research before I go out and have some fun first. So you have that kind of passion for a topic. It's important to go beyond what, uh, what I think so, uh, because you want to make it an academic paper, even though you can do it on any topics. And in fact, it can be a lot of fun doing things on your hobby or your personal interest and throw an academic lens um, against it to see what kind of results you get and what kind of uh, perspective you can come across. Uh, so that means that you want to find some evidence or data to support your arguments. And that also means you want to find evidence or data to see if, be open-minded to see if it refute, refute your uh, initial conceptions of topics. The finally, uh, your own insights can be very useful and um, that would help you further along in terms of finding evidence or data or uh, fine tuning your topics. We're gonna go through a small um, exercise with you all. Um, oops, sorry, share our video here. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Sorry about that. Back. Olivia or uh, Liz, do you happen to have the 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 link for this? Um, because I'm clicking on it. I thought when I click on it, it will open it, but it's not opening. Um, do you have it? Um, in the meantime, so it's through the wire, uh, wire website is start with questions. Um, thank you. So what we're going to do is an exercise. I'm going to share this, uh, with everyone. So if you have a piece of, uh, paper and pen, maybe it's, it will be uh, helpful for you. So you, I'm going to stop it. So we're going to give it a try, this exercise that you will have access to as well to do it on your own, but we're going to do it right now. Uh, Okay, so you are um, gonna give you like a few seconds to write down your topic. You uh, came to us with topics already, so hopefully um, you have it handy.
So we also ask you to come with, uh, prepare with a couple questions about your topic. So these are some ideas right in this video that you can, um, anything that you can think about, you can write as many questions as you like, you can narrate them later, but for now, any anything that you're curious about, about that particular topic. So we're gonna go back to the presentation here. Um, and hopefully that was helpful. And you will have the link in the, the package as well if you wanna go through this exercise again. Okay, so now if you have a topic or an idea or even a question and you wanna volunteer and put it in the chat, uh, this is the time when Joseph will uh, look at the question and give you some feedback. That way, you know um, how um, if you need to narrow down your thesis more, or he can give you guidance or direction. That's kind of how he would advise you if you make an appointment with him. So, if anyone wants to um, volunteer your question or idea, okay, so just volunteer a topic. Joseph, do you have any any thoughts? Sure. About the first thing is, what kind of vaccine are we talking about? What time period? Uh, what kind of disease we are trying to get at? Uh, are we looking at the science behind it, or we're we talking about the social aspects? When we talk about inequality, um, there are different elements related to it. It can be geographical, it can be temporal, it can be uh, by ethnicity, uh, gender, sexuality, identities, all sorts of different ways to narrow it down to a topic that might work. Uh, in addition to vaccine inequality, you can tie into different perspectives, maybe cultural, maybe economics, it can be development, it could be uh, business oriented. So there are different ways to kind of tackle this. It really depends on what you're interested in, in particular. That's wonderful, Joseph. You see in like a few seconds, he already gave us so much information and so many questions that you can go through, right? Um, it's a very, very broad topic. Um, so we have another one um, that I see, the influence of globalization on the creation of giant corporations like Amazon and the impact on small businesses. So again, we can look at when we say talk about giant corporations, what aspects of Amazon are we talking about uh, and the impact on the small business? So are we talking about retail business or are we talking about uh, website hosting? Uh, it depends on uh, what you're interested in and what uh, we talk about the macro level or you want to talk about the micro level. You can do both or you can do all three levels, micro, meso and my, uh, micro. So uh, it depends on uh, which part of globalization or anti-globalization that you might be interested in in relation to Amazon, and especially in terms of Amazon, if they are doing um, the transfer of goods across borders and whether they are doing different selling between different portals that they have for different countries and how they might be selling it locally or versus globally. 
Mm-hmm. And and usually during these appointments, uh, as you can see, Joseph uh, keeps repeating that it depends on what you're interested in. You know, you can come up with so many different questions, but it's what your your interest uh, is. Um, and we're going to do one last one, um, just in interest. They're really interesting topics, by the way. So if you want to talk more about this, you have Joseph um, to make an appointment with. You have your faculty advisor, undergraduate research center. Brady, we have an IDS student here. Um, how would increased accessibility to renewable energy production affect the progression of development in underdeveloped nations today? Okay, let me think real quick. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about accessibility, we need to talk about um, who is getting the accessibility uh, right now because there is an inherent uh, disadvantage on uh, underdeveloped countries in terms of both technology and economic cloud in the energy production or in many cases where they are exporting the energy sources but not refining it into a refine into a sellable product per se that makes a lot more money. So how could increase accessibility to renewable energy? So are we talking about technology transfer to the uh, under de- underdeveloped worlds? Or are we talking about uh, training the people so much so? So it's not so much as giving them the technology, but training them so that they can train. So it's kind of like teaching people how to fish so they can fish for themselves. Mm-hmm. So as you can see, even when the uh, Brady questions, uh, your question is actually very specific more than just a topic and even when it looks like it's very specific you can even go more specific than that Um, and the more it is the easier it is when you do your research uh, because when it's not as narrow you don't narrow it down as much as you you should um, you're going to have you're going to have a lot of data and a lot of reading and it is a little more difficult to get to 30 to 50 pages right because you can talk about a topic for Mm -hmm. I'm going to put my email in the um, chat box because my calendar is not open to everybody. So I reserve my calendar primarily for uh, the two departments that I'm the liaison with, the social welfare and the global studies. So the best way to make an appointment with me is to send me an email. Great. Thank you, Joseph. And I know we put you on the spot, but you're really good at this. So every time we give you topics, it's like it's great to see how your mind uh, works. So um, thank you all for for those who volunteered. Um, We have this um, sheet as well as part of the packet that you're going to be receiving. And this is for global studies and it was created by Joseph and exactly what he did, this exercise he did with you. um, This is he put it down on like asking your questions about your topic. So you can do this yourself as well before meeting with him. So you have a little more information to go off and have a, a better conversation, more insightful and rich conversation. Now, a reminder um, for, before, these are the next steps, but a reminder for global studies students, uh, the note at the bottom of this, of this uh, slide, the topic must be on globalization. So as you, I saw many people, if you're talking about migra- um, immigration, that is globalization, right? When you're talking about vaccines, the first topic, it has to be, you have to be related. If it is inequality, you're talking about something that's across borders. So if you're just talking about vaccines here in the US or something more domestic, that will not come for global studies. So that has to be something in your mind. Every time you're looking at your topic, it has to be something that's crossing borders. If you have issues, uh, Joseph's really good at helping out with that, but our office as well. So if you're thinking about a topic, and you're not sure if it's global studies related, you can always talk to myself or Liz, make an appointment and we can help you with that. With IDS, it has to be development oriented. And for area studies, if you're, for example, like Maria was European studies, as long as the topic is on something related to Europe, right, Olivia, are those, is that the criteria? Yeah. Or if your Asian studies is something related to Asia, that would be approved for that major. Okay, so these are next steps uh, for the spring quarter um, for week three to seven. We recommend that you begin begin reading, but just as Mary suggested, you're going to be reading a lot of different journals and sometimes some reading is going to be useful, some other not so much. But what we've heard from students, they use one of this um, uh, is, um, I think it's databases or um, um, Sotero and Note or Mendeley to to compile all your notes because sometimes you're going to be reading and you don't know what was useful and what's not. 
Um, also, so reading is to, to start. Uh, it will help you find a topic and a question that you'd like to explore. Also, after you do that, it, during week eight, hopefully you develop a broad topic idea and a little more of like a research question. It doesn't have to be too narrow because at that point you're still reading and trying to find out what the research question will be. But at that point you can begin uh, meeting with possible advisors. You wanna have an idea of what you wanna research before you contact the advisor so they know what is it that they can help you or not, or if they can refer you to someone. Uh, once you find hopefully a faculty advisor by the end of, of spring, and it's good to reach out to them as soon as possible because a lot of times um, they, once they're busy with two or three students, they've taken two or three students that might want to help you, but they might not have the time. So the sooner you reach out to them, the better. And for the summer, Joseph is available during the summer as well. So you can always make an appointment with him, meet, meet with him and discuss a topic, literature reviews, um, tips for start writing and your proposal. And in September, um, we hope you secured, by that time you already have your advisor secured and um, you have at least read at least 10 scholarly sources by then. Okay, and we have a few links, I think, that we will be, um, that Olivia is, uh, uh, Olivia and Liz are adding to, um, are typing in the chat. One is the UCLA Library Research Guide. That is where you're going to find, we're asking you to read and compile notes, and this is where you will find a lot of journals, and you can find readings on the topic uh, that you're interested in. If you're not sure where to begin the reading process, you can also ask Joseph. He's the one who created one of this the Global Studies Library Guide uh, based on topics. And so if you're not sure which one you should use or which reading or journal, you can always ask him as well. And Liz also um, put something else in the chat, some summer research opportunities. We just found out about this from the honors office. If you want to start on your research in the summer, it's a really cool opportunity you get stipends. And so many students don't do research that we do in global studies um, that is required. So if you want to take advantage of those opportunities, I think some deadlines are coming up in May. And these also will be in the packet that we're going to be sending you. Uh, and finally, Olivia also added our survey. So before you uh, log out, it'd be really, really helpful if you um, complete this very brief survey uh, to give us some feedback on how we can improve this workshop uh, in the future for other students in the future. And if you have any questions, I don't see any questions in the chat, but you can type questions in the chat or also unmute yourself if you have questions. We'll be around for the next few minutes. Thank you so much to everyone who's here today for participating. Thank you, Joseph, for being here as always and for helping our students uh, with your wisdom. Uh, so we'll be here uh, for the next few minutes, but thank you all. Thank you, thank you yeah. for student speakers too, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, we still have them here. I thought they had left. I see Maria mm -hmm. and Mary. Yes, thank you for coming. We really appreciate you being here. Mary, Maria, and Amanda. And Maria is here still, in case you have questions also for Maria or for Mary. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I had a quick question. Um, is Dr. Yu available only to global studies students or is he able to work across departments? I don't know if he's still here. Oh. I'm, I'm available to uh, meet with you. Um, my colleagues is outside. So I usually work with my colleagues who, Belgium, who do international development studies. So uh, I can get you started. And then once uh, she's available, you can be with her. Okay, thank you so much. All right, and thank you for the workshop, it was very helpful. Of course, Brady. Hopefully you end up doing honors. I hope we'll see your application soon. <laughs> Great.
Okay, well, thank you so much, Maria and Mary, for being here. It was great. It's so nice to see how much you've gained from this process. Uh, we're so proud of you, too. And thank you for always being in our honors, like the meetings and being so proactive and active. And it's been a pleasure working with you, too, so far. Looking forward.